All right, so, um, you know, we're going to keep this theme of foot care going, and it's my pleasure to have uh, Dr. Michael Langlois here uh, from South Texas Podiatry Group, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about foot care and preventative therapies, so ideally avoiding the problems I showed you with my presentation. Okay, good, good, uh, good morning. Um, thank you, Dr. Brasad, for inviting me here. I've had the pleasure and privilege of working with Dr. Brasad uh, for the past few years at uh, UT Health. I worked out of the Texas Diabetes Institute. We saw a lot of um, critical limb ischemic patients. And um, uh, before I met Dr. Brasad, I had no idea that cardiologists um, that did this line of work. We always consulted the vascular surgeons. Um, but over the years, I developed a very good relationship with Dr. Brasad, and we had some really excellent uh, results and helped, uh, were able to help a lot of people. Okay, so diabetic foot ulcers. Um, the lifetime risk of an individual with diabetes developing one is up to 25%. It's pretty, pretty high. Um, and the causal factors that lead to, um, to foot ulceration are multifactorial. Certainly PAD is a huge risk factor, but um, also neuropathy, um, the patient's social, social situation, um, nutrition, um, the, f the presence of deformity are all um, risk factors. So, um, as a podiatrist, my my um, uh, job is to look at all these various risk factors and try to figure out which, which ones we can uh, mitigate. Um, because diabetic foot infections often lead to hospitalization, very costly, very costly to treat. They require the coordination of multiple specialties, disciplines, surgery. Um, so. If we can identify risk factors early and mitigate them, that's uh, all the better for all of us. So when you, you, you first, um, just kind of an overview again, and a lot of this will um, coincide with uh, Dr. Prasad's earlier talk. Um, the past history of a foot ulcer is a huge indicator of additional future of foot ulcerations and amputation. Uh, peripheral neuropathy is major. Uh, deformities, PVD of course. Um, and in line with this conference, uh, nephropathy, especially dialysis, um, major risk factor, as Dr. Prasad's last talk alluded to. Uh, again, poor glycemic control, cigarette smoking, and a history of prior amputation. Here are the three major things that lead to diabetic foot um, ulcers. Neuropathy, PVD, and abnormal stress. Sometimes ulcers are more skewed towards a neuro neuropathic origin and Sometimes they're almost purely ischemic, but most of the time they're neuroischemic. It's a combination of the two of them. Um, what happens is in diabetics, there are other derangements uh, in their joints and deformities that r result in the foot that lead to increased plantar foot pressures. And in the combination in, in that setting of neuropathy and PVD um, leads to ulceration. So neuropathy may present either as a mono or polyneuropathy, but most Commonly in diabetics, it's symmetric polyneuropathy. Um, you get sensory neuropathy, motor neuropathy, autonomic neuropathy. Uh, the morphological findings of the nerve can show a, a reduction in myelinated nerve fiber density, less effective um, regeneration, and capillary endothelium dysfunctions, hyperplasia. It's, and um, the situation in diabetics with a Hyperglycemic state leads to, of course, metabolic derangements in various pathways that leads to increased oxidative stress and inflammation, um, uh, which potentiate neuropathy. So the diabetic who has a neuropathic presentation can present sometimes with both positive and negative symptoms. The positive symptoms are more your pain symptoms, burning, sharp, shooting pain, which can sometimes be treated with gabapentin, Lyrica, medications like that. Um, but more damaging in terms of the diabetic foot and development of ulcerations are the negative symptoms or the numbness, loss of sensation. Um, pain's a good thing. When you're walking, we subconsciously feel pain in various points in our foot. 
and we subconsciously adjust the way we walk or stand to re reduce those pressure points. With sensory neuropathy, a diabetic doesn't make those subconscious adjustments. So when they walk, they increase pressure on certain points of their foot, and that leads to tissue breakdown and ulceration. Um, in addition to, to sensory neuropathy, you, you, kinda, you also have motor neuropathy. You have a lot of uh, internal intrinsic muscles in the foot. Um, uh, lumbricals, interosseous muscles, they all work to stabilize the position of the toes. With diabetic neuropathy, those connections are lost and those muscles um, weaken and mechanical advantages are gained by some of the larger flexor muscles which lead to uh, digital deformities, hammer toes, bunions, and all of those deformities are, will increase pressure um, which helps potentiate formation of ulcers. Um, these next slides kind of uh, focus on uh, correlation between renal function and um, uh, neuropathy, diabetic foot, infl um, th foot infections and ulcers. Um, a lot of them um, overlap with uh, Dr. Prasad's last presentation. But certainly, renal function decline and neuropathy go hand in hand. They're often, uh, in many ways, they're caused by a similar mechanism, microvascular complications and endothelial dysfunction. Um, so this study here highlights that um, patients with foot insensitivity, peripheral sensory neuropathy, um, correlated with higher uh, GFRs and higher prevalence of uh, albuminuria compared to patients with intact sensation. Um, chronic kidney disease is a predictor of outcome after revascularization of the ulcerated diabetic foot. Um, so this study showed that the increased risk of failure or um, subsequent amputation was higher with the higher um, level of kidney disease that the patient had. And of course, going along with everything we already know, dialysis patients were at particular risk, um, as high as 40%. Um, dialysis itself is an independent risk factor for ulceration. This was a cross-sectional uh, study of 326 consecutive patients with diabetes and uh, stage 4 or 5. And dialysis and prior foot amputation were shown to be um, associated um, highly with current presence of foot ulceration. And finally, as you know, dialysis is a very poor predictor, or is, I'm sorry, is a good predictor of poor outcome in um, in patients, 95% of dialysis patients in this study were found to have a high-risk um, component, PAD, neuropathy, foot ulceration, prior amputation. The study also looked at various ethnic groups in a dialysis population. Since it's, been, since it's known that there are ethnic variations in risk factors, um, they wanted to see if ethnic variations among dialysis population, uh, and they found none, basically at the end stage um, among the dialysis population, ethnic um, variations uh, were less important. Um, autonomic, autonomic neuropathy is important uh, to keep an eye on. Um, one thing that happens is the autonomic nerves uh, help hydrate the skin. They control the sweat glands. So with um, autonomic neuropathy, you can develop anhydrosis, cracking, fissuring, callus formation, ulcerations, um, and also AV shunting. These normal uh, physiologic processes are all disrupted. Um, so you can develop what's called a neuropathic edema where diabetics with neuropathy can have a lot of increased foot swelling uh, due to dysregulation of AV shunting. Um, again, I won't get too much into PVD. I think the other uh, speakers will cover that a lot better than me. Uh, but just again, to, to recognize it's a major, major risk factor for uh, diabetic foot ulcers. Um, uh, and poor outcome. Uh, limited joint mobility. So glycosylization of collagen causes thickening, cross-linking of collagen bundles, causing the thin to become thin, waxy, and tight. It also results in joint um, immobility. Um, so less flexible joints, decreased range of motion. This all puts increased um, pressure, particularly on the toe joints, especially the big toe joint when we're walking, and that's why um, right under the first metatarsal head is one of the most common spots uh, you'll find a diabetic foot ulcer. This study um, continues with that theme, the limited range of motion, um, the over-stimulating process of keratization, 
and then the extrinsic um, pressures uh, that develop traumas, foreign bodies, or inappropriate footwear. Um, sometimes diabetics, again, they don't, they have poor sensation and they, they'll put their shoes on too tight because they can't feel them. And uh, that's a common source of ulceration that I find. So getting back, start off uh, this part with um, a little bit of overview of what I kind of do in the clinic in a preventative sense. Uh, at the university, they were very good about, the primary care uh, physicians were very good about sending all their newly diagnosed diabetics um, to podiatry for a foot screening. Um, so the first assessment um, that we'll do with them is get a good history from them. Um, uh, history of, uh, look at it, past histories of ulcers or amputations, uh, Charcot, prior vascular surgeries or angioplasties, and especially cigarette smoking. Um, uh, asking about claudication, rest pain, um, neuropathic symptoms, if they're experiencing burning, tingling, or, um, or numbness. And again, of course, looking at their renal history. Um, we'll next move on to the physical exam section where we're kind of looking at their skin. Um, color, thickness, dryness, cracking, again, um, autonomic neuropathy leads to anhydrosis, cracking, fissuring, portals of entry for infections, checking in between the toes, particularly the fourth and fifth toes. You can see in this slide, it's often a uh, place where you get these interdigital tinea pedis or macerations, and I've seen many patients come in with huge abscesses um, and necessitating amputation because uh, of um, these little web space lesions that become a portal of entry for infection. Uh, calluses, calluses are a precursor to ulcers. A callus formation tells you that there's increased pressure at that, spot, at that point. And if those calluses aren't routinely debrided, uh, they'll progress to ulceration uh, quite quickly. So it's important um, to identify callus areas. Um, and what we can do as podiatrists is provide them with specialized insoles to help take some pressure off those areas and also um, just to seed them routinely, see them every two, three months uh, so that they can be shaved and debrided so that they don't progress uh, to ulceration. Onychomycosis as well, Most a lot of diabetics have very bad fungal toenails. Uh, they try to cut them themselves, they can't, they're so thick, they don't have the right tools. And often I've seen pe patients injure themselves trying to cut, cut their own toenails, uh, leading to amputations. So um, Medicare recognizes these things the, as uh, medically necessary, and so diabetics who have fungal toenails, calluses, qualify to be seen by the podiatrist every uh, two or three months uh, to have these things taken care of, and it's probably one of the most you know, simple, ridiculous things I do, but it's probably one of the most um, beneficial in, in really helping and preventing uh, some of the, the long-term uh, devastating consequences of diabetes. Uh, the vascular exam, extremely important. I think most of the panel will um, talk about that in more detail, but um, as a podiatrist, I'm one of the first lines in, in screening it, so ch checking their foot, basic foot pulses, having a Doppler in the office, uh, Doppler in their pulses, if find a monophasic pulse or absent pulse ordering uh, a workup. And of course, being aware of, um, Dr. Prasad has recently talked about the calcification of uh, vessels uh, creating false positives on these ABIs. It's, it's extremely common. You can probably take an x-ray of the foot and the arteries have a higher density than the bone, so you know, you gotta be careful uh, interpreting these results. Um, and then getting them promptly to um, the specialist vascular or a cardiologist uh, to see if uh, we can get inter intervene earlier uh, to prevent any uh, progression to ulceration. And the musculoskeletal exam is extremely important. Um, deformities, deformities are generally what bring on the ulcers. It's pressure points from bunions and hammer toes rubbing on the shoes that cause skin breakdown, in the setting of neuropathy and PVD. So identifying you know, patient deformity and getting them educated about proper shoe wear uh, again, Medicare has a diabetic shoe program. Um, again, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and I talked earlier about the muscle wasting uh, and the intrinsic muscles of the foot that can lead to these deformities as well. And then finally, this x-ray here at the bottom is an example of a Charco foot. Charco neuropathy, as many of you have probably heard, it's a, type of, it's a very special type of arthritis that diabetics with severe neuropathy develop. It's generally caused by these repetitive cycles of microtrauma that cause um, 
micro fractures in the various bones that keep going through this cycle of fracturing, deforming, and, um, and resetting, and then just this process keeps continuing until the foot becomes more progressively deformed. Particularly, we often see collapse of the cuboid bone, um, and this sort of rocker bottom type foot leads to a lot of ulceration around the midfoot, and salvaging these, these feet are, uh, are particularly challenging. Um, some various offloading devices um, uh, that we have when a patient does develop an ulcer. Uh, this is a crow walker boot for patients with that type of charcoal deformity uh, that, I, that I showed you in the last slide. A total contact cast, which is sort of the gold standard in offloading uh, diabetic foot ulcers. Here's an example of some shoes that are good for forefoot ulcers to take the pressure off the forefoot. And sometimes the good old crutches just to completely get them off their foot if they're able to use crutches. Um, it's very beneficial. Talk briefly about the diabetic shoe program. Medicare will recognize certain qualifying conditions in diabetics um, and provide them with a pair of um, shoes. The shoes are often made of a soft material that the um, deformities uh, won't rub against so hard. They also will provide uh, three pairs a year of um, these specialized insoles which can be heat moldable um, to help reduce um, pressure points that you've identified. Uh, the neurological assessment, um, 10 gram mon monofilament, where you check um, 10, 10 different spots on the foot um, for the ability to feel uh, the pressure of the monofilament. Um, that's a very good predictor of their level of neuropathy uh, and the need to properly offload them. Uh, this is a biothesiometer. It vibrates at a particular level. Greater than 25 volts is con considered abnormal. The vibratory sensation is often what goes first. So that can be your first predictor of the development of neuropathy. Their ability to feel the, the, or the loss of ability to feel the monofilament comes generally after they've lost um, vibratory um, uh, perception. So once you take all these components of the physical exam, I, be, I generally will risk stratify the patient into one of these various categories based on the presence of neuropathy, peripheral artery disease, deformity. Sometimes we'll find a fairly well-controlled diabetic who doesn't really have any risk factors. We'll see them yearly, just, um, but it's a great chance to have them in front of you to provide them with education about the consequences of not controlling their diabetes or developing uh, an ulcer or amputation. Um, loss of protective sensation with the presence of deformity. And we can get them into accommodative shoes, see them about every three to six months. Um, some of the more high risk patients, particularly those with peripheral arterial disease and loss of protective sensation, um, vascular consultation, Accommodated footwear, we'll see them more frequently every two to three months. And for the most high risk group, those who have already had sustained an ulcer and amputation, see them almost monthly or every one to two months. Um, so that's sort of what we do in the clinic outpatient setting um, to help try to identify these risk factors early and mitigate them if possible. I'll briefly kind of go through sort of um, the inpatient side where we're consulted on um, infections um, that necessitate um, limb salvage or um, amputation. Um, so these are some of the main principles um, in the process of limb salvage of the foot. One is debridement of non-viable infected tissues. And we often stage these procedures. A lot of times the first thing you do is if you're presented with an acutely infected foot, cellulitis, abscess, osteomyelitis, uh, before anything else you want to get rid of that infection, prevent spread of sepsis or further damage. Um, so the initial debridement or amputation is performed, um, always attaining the appropriate cultures um, to help um, uh, provide a more appropriate antibiotic um, regimen. Of course, so many of the things that we have to do to treat these foot infections are harmful to the kidney. Um, a lot of strong antibiotics, contrast from uh, imaging studies, angiograms. Um, so anything we can do to reduce the amount of nephrotoxins to these uh, patients during the treatment is always appropriate and good. Of course, um, looking at their circulation, optimizing them medically. Um, uh, nutrition consults are uh, very important uh, during these admissions. And um, of course, taking into consideration post-amputation rehabilitation. So here's sort of an acutely affected foot. You can see pus coming out of the big toe. 
uh, osteomyelitis on x-ray. First step in a patient like this, inpatient would, um, when appropriate, get them to the OR as soon as possible, perform the primary amputation. Once the infections, get them on antibiotics. And then when appropriate, um, we'll consult, um, uh, consult the vascular. In my case, I mostly consulted Dr. Prasad, who um, kindly evaluated my patients and uh, improved their flow. Um, an important part of the surgery is to get appropriate cultures in surgical pathology. Um, I would often get an initial culture right when they came to the ER, but then during the surgery, we'd do a full amputation debridement uh, right down to the healthy tissue. At that point, we'd kind of we'd re-scrub re the field, change our gloves, and then we'd get cultures off of the healthy remaining part of the foot. It was always important, to, in addition to the cultures, to get a, a segment of bone for pathology. It was always important to coordinate the results of the pathology specimen with the cultures, because sometimes the cultures would come back with a false positive, but if you knew that the, the bone path was a negative, um, you could rule that out, and clean margins are always good because they require less post-surgical um, um, antibiotics. Um, like I said, this is a um, consultation to the vascular surgeon. Uh, angiosomes are important to think about. Where, where's, where is the ulcer? What, what, you know, Dr. Prasad was the first one who ever asked me, what angiosome do you want me to, to work on? And I had never even thought about it before. It's like, wow, um, I don't know. Uh, so it's important, you gotta to realize where, where, where are we working? Where's the ulcer? Where's the, where's the, um, uh, where's the ischemia? Where do they need to target? Um, so that's important for us to keep in mind. And finally, your final, once, um, once the, the foot's been properly debrided, you've got your proper cultures, you've hopefully got down to clean margins, you've got your path reports back, everything's looking good, you're revascularized. I do a final revision procedure where we'll try to make an attempt to close as much as we can. Sometimes full closure is not possible. We'll have to do wound vac therapy, other um, wound care grafting later on. Um, but that's our final stage before we can get them out of the hospital. Um, and then finally, uh, post-surgical rehabilitation prosthetics. UT has a great prosthetics department. Um, uh, this is a device here, it's an ankle foot orthotic. You can um, fit the, these are made for transmetatarsal amputations. So the midfoot amputation where all the toes are removed. The foot can fit nicely into this molded um, foot plate and then it connects uh, to the calf, uh, and patients walk quite well uh, with these. These are some other types of shoe fillers. This one for partial amputations, partial ray amputations. Uh, these two for transmetatarsal amputations. So, uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs>